coming up in today's program. Monks behaving badly. It's very unusual for people to criticize Buddhism. Portugal's missing treasures. And the Filipino comeback kids. I wanted them to make a difference. But first, Arts World visits Lebanon to get an insider's perspective on the country's art scene. Hi, welcome to Arts World and to Lebanon. My name is Yamin Sukari and I'm a filmmaker here in Beirut. What I love about my city are the different communities and contrast. In our first story, let's go see how Beirut is also inspiring artist Zena Al Khalil. My name is Zena Al Khalil. Um, I'm an artist. I was 18 years old when I moved here. Beirut at the time, we had just come out of years of civil war. Somehow, within the chaos, there was a lot of freedom and space for expression and creativity. Beirut is central to all of my works. I think as I was coming of age, Beirut was being reborn. So in a way, we kind of grew up together. Like Beirut became a person somehow, and we started having this relationship, which I describe as very love-hate. Images of pop stars, politicians, saints, and resistance fighters are found in Zain al-Khalil's work. This playful juxtaposition is her way of reflecting the uniqueness and complexity of Lebanese society. I'm just reacting to my environment, and these symbols are very prominent in my environment. And the political images, I use a lot of illustrations of guns, I use a lot of references to religion, I work on portraits of political leaders. It's my lens and my view on my city. A lot of images I use repetitively. And I think of them as, a, for example, an artist will set out his colors before he starts painting. You fill out your palette. And in a way, these icons or images have become my palette. So like what could translate to the color, let's say, green, for me is maybe a Kalashnikov. What translates to purple might be uh, the Virgin Mary. So I, I use a lot of these icons in the work repetitively because they've become a sort of vocabulary. All my work has been about war. In a way, it's just because it's all around me. 2005, there was the assassination of Hariri, and then the uh, car bombs that followed after that. 2006, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. I'm working on a series of paintings now, specifically about that time period. One of the events that happened was the Israelis were practicing psychological warfare, if you want to call it, by dropping uh, leaflets. Uh, you know, from airplanes. There was one particular flyer that uh, I found. I picked up the flyer and I realized it was a cartoon. The Syrian president, the leader of Hamas, and the Iranian president. And there they were, sitting all together, playing their magical flutes around uh, what appears to be Hassan Nasrallah, the leader, the Hezbollah leader, coming out as a cobra. And I guess it was some kind of psychological message to get people to think that uh, Nasrallah is not acting on behalf of Lebanon. And I thought it was, I thought it was really funny because, um, first of all, I don't think it would take a very badly drawn flyer to get people to change their opinions on, on Hezbollah. And it, it, it's quite comical. Anyway, I collected as many as I could and because a lot of my work involves kind of taking things from around my city, around my environment. I wouldn't say that my artwork is political. I think that my work is reactionary. And where I live 
is very politically charged. I wouldn't say anyone has been offended by my artwork. I think it provokes people, gets people to think, uh, engage in dialogue. Having exhibited her visual art successfully in the West, Zena has recently taken her fascination with Beirut from the canvas to the page, authoring a personal account of her relationship with her city. The book is called Beirut, I Love You. And it's a memoir about my life in Beirut. The good times, the bad times, the extremes, the, the, the joy, the depression, the chaos, the madness, the war. The problems with trying to live in a post-war city are many. Nothing works the way it should, not even the people. We live under the threat that at any time things could flare up again. We live under the constant humiliation of the horrible things we did to each other only a few years earlier. I remember the stories of the Holiday Inn. It's one of the highest buildings in Beirut. During the war, it was taken over by a militia who found it entertaining to throw people off the rooftop and try and shoot them in midair. Today, we stand side by side as we wait in lines to get into nightclubs. Despite the difficulties of living in Beirut, I feel that as long as I can love it or keep love, everything's gonna be okay. This is Martis Square in the center of Beirut. When Lebanese people want to protest, this is where they come. In our next story, we go to Thailand where protest is being expressed through art. Thai people have a very, very high standard or idealistic of how monks should behave. It's very unusual for people to criticize Buddhism. They st stay away from taboo issues th such as religion. Any critique of anything that is a symbol of Buddhism such as monks or temples is going to harm their karma. Six monks were arrested for distributing methamphetamines, uh, trafficking drugs, and it's like, ooh. It's just the media, they love, they love it when there's this kind of story because they know that it sells well. So when there's something that comes out and, and, you know, say the whole, all monks are portrayed in this such a way, it becomes a big an uproar. Artist Anupong Janton's depictions of monks behaving badly has polarized opinion in Thai society. Jan Ton won a prestigious art award for these paintings. This award then sparked an open national debate on how much monks can and should be criticized in a country where they are traditionally respected. Someone can say that he's very brave, you know, he's a very strong, brave artist, and some can say that, you know, he's, he's very, very foolish. A robe does not make just anybody a monk. Sometimes it's only a person wearing a yellow robe who has exploited the sacred uniform. Newspaper stories about monks involved in drugs and sex scandals are very disturbing for us Buddhists, but also very true. We might not want to speak about it, but we must accept that it is happening. People regard monks very highly. You know, especially the robes, uh, the, the robes, the color of the robes that sort of represent, you know, the Buddha's religion. You know, to use it as canvas, you know, a lot of Thai people will find it offensive. It is because I'm concerned about Buddhism in my own community. I don't mean to focus on the problems in our religion. I just want to nudge people to pay attention to the problems. It is impossible that my paintings can change the face of society overnight, but at least I hope that it encourages us to improve and move in the right direction. I'm not surprised, you know, because I think that sooner or later, young artists or, you know, Thai society are moving towards sort of breaking these barriers. And breaking barriers is what well-known theatre director Tira Watmoon Wilai wanted to do when he decided to take Anupong's paintings to the stage. His performance is a critique that uses a Japanese style of dance called Buto. I don't consider these monks as monks. They are sinful people who take advantage of Buddhism and become monks. 
I'm trying to increase the public's awareness of our current problem. The way that most of the members of BFLOOR work when they are doing a production is that you begin with a question or you begin with something that you want to explore without having a real um, goal in mind of what the production will turn out to be. A lot of it depends on um, what is found during explorations and rehearsal. With Buto, we shave our heads and paint our bodies white to erase our identity, our human quality so that we can be a blank canvas and be anything we choose to be. There's very little spoken word. And so in that sense, it poses a challenge because there's no way to predict exactly what the final production will be. And the response has been favorable. Most people seem to really appreciate being able to see a public criticism, in fact, of Thai culture or things that they themselves might have questioned. It's also using humor to critique things and not just showing the darkest side of behavior for people to look at and feel horrified, but that they can also laugh at themselves. Don't go away, because after the break, we're going to Portugal, where works of art are disappearing literally off the walls. Welcome back to Arts World and to Beirut, where much of the city was destroyed by years of war. Portugal's heritage is also being lost, but this time, it's not war. It's crime that's to blame. Perched on the banks of the Tagus River, Lisbon is a city with a history that stretches back 20 centuries. And the walls of these ancient buildings have many stories to tell. These children at the Portuguese Museum are learning about their tile heritage. Para, uh, demonstrar o potencial. These tiles are really masterpieces. They can be seen as calling cards for the artists who painted them. Tile art has a great capacity to reinvent itself. It's able to preserve the Portuguese spirit, but also absorb new techniques and create new forms of artistic expression. These unique blue and white tiles were introduced to the region in the 14th century by the Moors. Over the years, the designs evolved from Islamic geometric shapes to images from Portugal's past. They're called azulejos, which is the Portuguese word for blue, but some say its name refers to the Arabic word azuleji, meaning polished stone. Many of these tiles have survived for hundreds of years. Even an earthquake in 1755 didn't manage to destroy them. This panel, dating back to the end of the 17th century, is known as the Great View of Lisbon. It is the biggest treasure of the museum, in fact of all Portuguese tile history. It represents the city of Lisbon, seen from the opposite bank of the Tagus River before the earthquake. What started as a practical way of protecting buildings against damp, heat and noise is now a treasure trove of stories. And these small ceramic squares are the history books. We didn't invent the Azulejos tiles, but no other country in Europe used it in such quantity and with such originality. Countries like Holland manufactured the Azulejos tiles, but that was mainly for export. Here in Portugal, we had, and still have, a massive production for internal use. They may be small, but many of these tiles are priceless, and tens of thousands of Azulejos are now being reported stolen every year. Portuguese police are cracking down on the thieves who have been prizing these historic tiles from public buildings. In fact, it's gotten so bad they have set up a crime awareness campaign called SOS Azulejo to try and get people to be more aware. This is a product that can easily circulate in the markets, both legal and illegal markets, without any difficulty. The problem is that most potential buyers who are interested in buying tiles don't even know that they were stolen. 
Some of the stolen tiles can break when they're pulled off the walls and ceilings, but those that make it to the black market in one piece can be sold for thousands of dollars. A day after this SOS Azulejo project had been launched, we received a phone call from somebody that had seen on our website the pictures of a tile panel that disappeared from his house many years ago. Finally, he got his tiles back after years of looking everywhere for them. It's estimated that more than 10,000 tiles have been stolen in the last few years, many of them ending up in private residences around Europe. Some have also been found for sale online, but the Portuguese police remain hopeful that their awareness campaign will help stamp this out. I'm in the town of Biblos, near Beirut, one of the oldest port cities in the world, and a big draw for tourists in Lebanon. Let's take a look now at how tourism is being boosted by dance in the Philippines. Nothing much disturbs the peace in the quiet agricultural city of Iloilo. But every January, the beating of drums awakens the sleepy town as it celebrates its devotion to the Santo Nino, or Child Jesus, with unabashed merrymaking. This is the Denagyang Festival. Though historically a solemn religious tradition, its grand finale is the Ati Ati Han. A raucous contest of tribal dance, recreating the legends of Elor Elor's early brown-skinned settlers, the Ati. Tribes, composed of the city's youth, compete fiercely to outdo each other in costume and choreography. Out of the 17 tribes that vie for the grand prize, one has long been touted as the tribe to beat. Viva! 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 Tribu Bola Bola, a band of high school boys and girls, has long held the number one spot on the Dinag Yang circuit. From 1994 to 2006, the tribe has won the competition eight times. In fact, they became so good, the organizers asked them to step down to give other groups a chance at the championship. But they are back after a three-year hiatus, rallied by their founder, a former school principal, who was determined to educate the Dinag Yang's audience. I want them to become the example. I wanted them to make a difference. The reason for the existence of the Dinag Yang is the Ati. And what of the artists? Their life, their culture, their livelihood. And if we do away with that, what, what is the reason for all of this? We stylize things, but we have to bring back essence of the rituals of the Ati and their lifestyle. It's a responsibility that Tribu Bola Bola has taken seriously by picking up themes from arty culture and combining them with innovations in design, music and choreography. This balance of the old and new is a challenge that gets tougher by the year. We are competing against ourselves, not with anybody. We have to compete with our own standards and that's the challenge that we have. Right now, the tribes are very cautious and wary about the return of Bola Bola. Tribu Bola Bola was a Grand Slam champion in the past. Now they're back and they are causing probably nightmares to, to the other tribes. By raising the bar of the Dinag Yang performances, Tribu Bola Bola has reinvented the Dinag Yang Festival, turning it into one of the top tourist events in the country and giving Ilo Ilo's locals even more reason to celebrate. 
Ilonggos now look forward to Dinagyang. They have a sense of ownership of Dinagyang. They do not want Dinagyang to fail. The first runner-up for this year's Dinagyang contest is Tribu Bola Bola. Though Tribu Bola Bola didn't go home with this year's championship, their six months of hard training were rewarded with a formidable spot at second place and the unmistakable admiration of fans welcoming them back into the competition. Win or lose, Tribu Bola Bola succeeded in transforming a traditional festival into a proud showcase of Elor Elor's expertise in the art of merrymaking, propelling the city toward a future as rousing as the Dinagyang's beating drums. So that's it from Arts World and from Beirut, a city well known for its nightlife. I'm going to have some fun, but thank you for watching and take care. Thank you.